Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Bill Leff is a well-known Iowa Cityan. Born and raised in Iowa City, the Leff family has played an important role in the legal community and in civic and service organizations. Phil's father was a lawyer as well as his younger brother Al. After graduating from the University of Iowa, Phil entered law school. During his schooling, he was called into the Air Force and after three years later returned to Iowa and obtained his law degree. Upon graduation, his father Arthur was waiting for Phil and presented him with 30 law files. His legal career had begun. That was 39 years ago, and the rest, as they say, is history. In addition to his busy practice, Phil finds time to be involved in the community and the university. For over 30 years, he has taught a course at the University of Iowa's Law School. He served on many boards, the Head Start Preschool at the beginning, Goodwill Industries of Southeast Iowa at the beginning, too the Board of Trustees of the Iowa City Public Library, that was twice, the Civil Rights Commission, Chamber of Commerce, Mercy Hospital Board of Directors, Hawkeye State Bank, since it was founded, and the Iowa City School Board. Both his father and his brother served on the school board at one time, too. Phil was elected president of the Kiwanis and served on numerous United Way committees. He has been a longtime member of the First United Methodist Church. Phil and his wife, Joyce, raised three children in Iowa City, Todd, Missy, and Adam, and they have four grandchildren. Welcome to One of a Kind, Phil. Thank you. I know you're one of these Iowa natives born and raised here, but how did your parents come to Iowa City? What brought them here? My father uh, came to Iowa City as a student uh, from the small town of Onawa, Iowa, in Monona County, in the western part of the state. and. Uh, simply stayed here after he got out of law school. Uh, he had met my mother in Ottawa, mm -hmm. and she followed about the time he graduated from law school. They were married in 28 or 29. So was it your maternal grandmother who was very interested and in supportive of education, of getting schooling? That was actually my paternal grandmother. My father's mother was a country school teacher mm -hmm. and uh, rode a horseback to school to teach in a small country school in the, what is now the popular Lus Hills near Turin, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, they farmed in a small um, homestead in a small area near Turin and then moved to Ottawa. So she was an old country school teacher and a very uh, strong educational disciplinarian. Did, did your father have any brothers or sisters? Yes, he had, uh, he had uh, a brother who was, uh, who was a, is a doctor, a uh, younger brother. He had a sister who was a school teacher, and he had an older sister who died um, when she was 18 or 19 years of age. So they had a four, four in the family. Tell me, what do you think you got from your parents? What, how did they influence you? Well, they uh, provided me somehow, very, very uh, quietly encouraged me to, and, and my brother Al, to uh, get an education, to uh, value family, uh, stay out of trouble, <laughs> um, and to stay, to stay close to uh, the basic traditional family values. Did you stay out of trouble in high school? You are, you're Not known necessarily, for, no. <laughs> you're known no. for having a wonderful sense of humor. I mean, were you kind of a cut up in high school at City well, High? Well, um, I don't know what I'd define it like that. We, uh, uh, if, we, if there had been a juvenile court in effect in those days, I probably would have <laughs> not had a career in the law. Um, 
we um, had exuberant, youthful <laughs> uh, activities in school that um, didn't really harm anybody, mm -hmm. but uh, disrupted school. We, John Lind and I fired a carbide cannon, homemade carbide cannon, down the third floor, floor hall of City High when the chemistry instructor was uh, out of the class for some reason. Um, Did, were you expelled? No, we weren't expelled, but uh, um, in fact, uh, the uh, they never really knew who did that. We got back in the classroom before the instructor got back. Uh, his name was John Walker, who at a reunion years later told me he knew that I had done that, but couldn't prove it. <laughs> um, we, oh, we put, uh, I think in Reich's Cafe one time we let, uh, we had been in our, chem in our chemistry class, we learned how to make, uh, it's called stink gas. It was uh, sulfuric acid, mm. basically. And mm -hmm. we let a small vial of that open in uh, Reich's Cafe. It's kind of a one rite time. of passage for for kids taking in chemistry. In its mildest <laughs> form of, uh, <laughs> of <a> criticism, <laughs> yes. Uh, but we didn't really, uh, we really didn't hurt anybody, although, mm -hmm. although we could. It was, uh, it was silly, but it was entertaining and, uh, um, and for the most part, fun. you managed to stay, it sounded like you managed to stay out of trouble. Did you, at that time, were you always going to be a lawyer? I think from the time I was in high school on, I, that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not just too sure why. I suppose if my father had been a garbage collector, that's what I would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I just followed his footsteps. So what is there uh, about law? being a lawyer that you you love so much I know you love your profession well the I suppose the thing I enjoy most is it's just a people oriented profession uh, it's like medicine you, you you deal with people every day and you have a chance to meet people help people um, it's challenging it's uh, it's lucrative it's mm -hmm. uh, enjoyable so there's uh, something that you should it's so much fun you shouldn't get paid for it basically but I like it mm. What do you, looking back, um, did you decide at the time of graduation from law school, or graduating from law school, that you weren't going to be a trial lawyer, or have you done trial work also at the beginning? Well, like every young lawyer in general practice, I started out um, doing trial work, uh, doing criminal trial work, criminal appointments, uh, minor trial work, and I enjoyed it in probably the first 20 years I did did trial work, but it became apparent to me that you have to do, to be good at it, you really have to do nothing but trial work and concentrate on it. And I, uh, and I was, didn't think I'd live as long as a trial lawyer. Uh, <laughs> those people are, will go from one pressure cooker to the other. And uh, I gradually eased out of that. And as the firm grew, other people who enjoyed that do the trial work, so I get to do the things I enjoy. Which is? And which oh, are? I, and the, the ones I is and are <laughs> enjoy, involved in. I like um, uh, and enjoy uh, estate planning, uh, probate, real estate transactions. Um, is that what you teach the, at the university? I teach a course in title examination and real estate transactions. Mm -hmm. For 30 years, that's been quite a commitment. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's been a very enjoyable experience. I, uh, Again, I followed my father's footsteps. Uh, he had taught some courses as an adjunct professor starting in the, in the time of the Second World War when uh, a good deal of the faculty was gone. Uh, they asked practitioners to teach uh, courses. He enjoyed it. Uh, when he got tired of doing that, Dean Ladd at the time uh, asked me if I would do that, promised me good football tickets to the football <laughs> games, which he reneged on. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> but, but I enjoyed it, and I have done it. Uh, except for a couple of years when I was on the school board and didn't have time to do both. I've done it since I started doing it. And I'm not sure. I in the early 60s, I started doing it. Well, I read that you graduated the, uh, number one in your class from law school, so you've had the advantage of both being here in Iowa at the law school and seeing the kids these last 30 years. Has it, is it more competitive now? Was it more competitive when you were there? How, how I think I'd have a hard time. Maybe even getting to law school now. Um, it's easier to teach than it is to be taught. I think. Um, the when I went to law school, the the uh, all, all that you had to do to get into law school was have a two point. It would be barely warm. Mm -hmm. uh, 
<laughs> and uh, then they then about the flunk out rate was somewhere close to 50 percent in the first year. So they gave everybody a chance, and if you couldn't cut it, you were gone. And uh, so it was very competitive from that standpoint. Now the competition, I think, is to get into law school. Once they're in, I don't think the uh, uh, mortality rate is, is very high. Um, but I've been impressed uh, over the years with the quality of the students and and. Uh, Though I, at time, at one time, I th never thought I would admit it. I think I've been impressed with the quality of the female students. But uh, law school is about 50 percent mm -hmm. uh, mixture now of male and female. But when I, in my class, there were there were two female students, and while they were extremely tough and uh, had fought their way through the system to get where they are. Um, the female students now, I think, are very competitive, worked hard to be sure to show that they can do the work. Mm -hmm. And I think in the legal profession now, that is, uh, especially in Iowa City, uh, our female lawyers are every bit as respected and good, and, and uh, it's no, it's nothing that strikes any, any attention among the, among the lawyers, and I think probably among clients uh, mm -hmm. uh, also. I want to ask you, um, do you have a one or two cases that are kind of unforgettable that uh, that you have uh, dealt with over the years, or um, is that hard uh, to pick out one or two that just have, are imprinted on your? I'm trying to think of those that I dare say of that. It would. I uh, uh, had a uh, uh, two farmers in a dis drainage. Uh, dispute over uh, the way the land irrigated and was eroding on one boundary to the other. And they had, they were two old, an older neighbor and a younger fellow that had fought on and off over the years. Uh, they uh, actually got in a fist fight uh, while the, uh, just before the trial started. My client was younger and won the fist fight. Um, <laughs> They, they went through district court, they went to the Supreme Court, and they sent it back to the district court and back up to the Supreme Court, and they had spent uh, probably enough money to pave in concrete the drainage area that they were arguing with that. But it was, it's a good example of how people can lose sight of what they're arguing and fighting about in litigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, also that there's nobody probably more stubborn than a farmer uh, when it comes to dealing with their land. To think of, uh, I've had some. Uh, I don't do marriage dissolutions uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had several cases of child custody that were that were difficult. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's one reason I, I chose not to do it anymore. That's too uh, too gut wrenching for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I got out of that. Um, I, two things I have grown to dislike in practice law. One was income tax preparation, which I stopped doing five years ago. My life has been, has it been immensely better since <laughs> Good. then. Good. Don't even do my own <laughs> tax return. Um, and stop doing marriage dissolutions. Mm -hmm. So I just do the, the kind of fun things I enjoy. Well, good. I want to ask you, your busy practice in teaching, and we're going to get to your community service involvement, but um, how did you uh, meet Joyce? I know she's an Iowa Cityan. Was she well, not this, born and raised no, here she too? No, she can't claim to be. Oh, she can't. No, that's, okay. That's reserved only for oh. <laughs> those people who are lucky enough to be born here. She came to Iowa City uh, from Waterloo, come one Waterloo. Is, gosh, I hope I got that right. Uh, she lived in Waterloo, let's put it that okay. way. Okay. And came to Iowa City uh, about junior high, mm -hmm. which is when I met her. Uh, and we had our first date. You I'm, not, I'm not sure she would describe it that way. We had a date. Uh, I think we, I think we were in ninth grade. It, it, she'll probably find fault with mm -hmm. the facts, but uh, <laughs> somewhere around there. And my good friend John Lind and I double dated. I we took. Uh, I my recollection is we went to a. Pl uh, there was a recreational. Um, facility that the city ran, it was called the Paper Doll, and it was where the parents sent their kids to be sure that they were monitored and mm -hmm. out of trouble. And we went to a, a function there, walked downtown at the end of the evening, and John and I between us had about 75 cents, if I recall, if that's right. Um, 
not enough to take the girls for some place to get something to eat. And we knew we had to get them home relatively soon. So we put them both in cabs at the yellow cab stand, which was the Hotel <laughs> Jefferson, and told the cab drivers to take them home. I didn't give Joyce any money. Uh, uh, never even thought about that. And so when she got home, she had to wake her dad up to come out and pay the cab driver. Mm. Uh, we didn't have a date again until about our senior year. I was going I think to it was say. yeah, it was it was just not happy. <laughs> I thought it was a very I thought it was a very I thought it was a very nice evening. I, John Other and I went down. i waking your father up in the middle. Well, or he's, he's reminded mm -hmm. me a time or two of, uh, of that uh, <laughs> over our married life. Uh, then we began to date in our senior year in high school, and we were married when we were twenty, <laughs> at the just before I started law school, mm -hmm. and when she was in the third year of finished had finished the third year of college here. Now you have three children. Just mm -hmm. tell me where they are and what they're doing with their lives. Well, the oldest is Todd, mm -hmm. uh, in his mid forties. I'm shocked to say. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a research scientist with Park Davis uh, Drug Company, which is on the on the medical campus at the uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He and his wife uh, have lived there for about five or six years. Uh, our, our middle child, Melinda, Missy, is married to Mike Petrock from uh, Iowa City <coughs> area, and they live in Kansas City. Um, she was a registered nurse until she married and has never gone back mm -hmm. uh, after she's had her first child. She, they have two children, Hannah and Nick, they're f soon to be 14, and well, good. Thereabouts. And Adam, is the youngest, is uh, is a veterinarian. That is to say, he has a veterinarian's degree, and he, he and his wife um, uh, are at Kent State in Kent, Ohio, and on the faculty there, they're both really, re really research biologists. Uh, he went to veterinary medicine to get an advanced equivalent of a PhD, mm -hmm. and he teaches. Uh, um, a, in Kent State, which is a part of a, they have a large state college system there, and he teaches um, chemistry and a um, variety of uh, anatomy, a variety of courses to pre, pre-nursing, pre-med, those kinds of things. Do and they and have children? They have two children. There they are, seven and five. Their names are. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. the, I know, uh, their name, Their names are Amelia, the youngest uh -huh. girl, uh, and Benjamin, who's the older boy. Okay. Small, small. Benjamin is a typical left. Uh -huh. If he's five feet eight when he's an adult, you're going to put him on a rack to stretch him <laughs> that far. Yeah. And Hannah, the Hannah, the uh, the ob is the opposite. It's the, tall. The Petrox brought some genetic height to the family, and she's, uh, she's as tall as I am now, uh, and she is just getting her growth. Are you enjoying being a grandfather? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a great grandfather. I, I uh, Good. enjoy the kids. Good. Yeah. Let's talk about, Phil, your community service, and I, I'm always interested in what, uh, over the decades, what our Iowa City school system has wrestled with, and you were on the school board at a really emotional time in um, our history of our community. Share mm -hmm. some, a couple of the stories of that time. Well, that was in the uh, uh, late 60s, and I think I was on the school board in 69, 70, and 71, or give mm -hmm. or take a year or two there. Um, it was... Um, a time period when uh, we were introducing sex education into the school system. Mm -hmm. In a way now that would be the most mundane, boring kind of uh, sex education uh, program, but it was met with a mixed reaction. Mm -hmm. I was on the school board two or three months and we were sued um, by a group of parents who were opposed to sex education uh, in the school system. Mm -hmm. Uh, that suit uh, eventually was dismissed, and we we survived that uh, that that uh, particular uh, problem. 
uh, and moved into uh, expanding girls athletics. Uh, at the time, uh, the girls athletic program was uh, pretty embryonic uh, and there was uh, not much push us to otherwise in the state to increase it. Girls basketball had been, but we didn't have girls basketball in Iowa City. Small schools had girls basketball. It was, I think it was tennis and very few activities. Mm -hmm. So we had decided that we should increase girls athletics and we had a lot of um, a lot verbal, of verbal, uh, verbal objections that it would ruin men's, boys, I guess I should say, athletics, that there was, weren't sufficient funds and there wasn't uh, enough coaches and so forth. And uh, uh, within probably, by the time I got off the board, it, the girls program was picked up and it was moving fast and it's, uh, it was within a few years the girls were participating much, much greater rate than anybody anticipated mm -hmm. and with a lot of enthusiasm and uh, I suspect one of these days we'll have a girls football team uh, <laughs> uh, in Iowa City. Was this at the time that your car was vandalized? Oh, Does that, that have was, to do with that was, the board? Um, yeah, that was, see, that was, I don't remember what it was that we were involved in. Were you at a school board meeting? Yeah, I was at a school board meeting. Somebody put, uh, somebody put diesel fuel in my gas tank. Uh, uh, a a uh, form of vandalism I wasn't familiar with before, mm -hmm. and it took me a while to figure out what was happening. And by that time, the car was fairly well screwed up, and I had to have a new gas tank and cleaned out. And mm -hmm. yeah, I had to I put a lock on my gas tank after that. And I had would get a few late phone calls at two or three in the morning, with calling me a variety of names that some I knew and some I hadn't heard of before. <laughs> um, but I, I, it, all in all, it was a, it was a good. We, did, we also changed the boundary between City High and the West, and that was, that was probably um, as cantankerous. I as was going to say yeah. pretty emotional. Well, most people didn't give a hoot about the educational values of the two schools. It was more the athletic, mm -hmm. which families were getting, getting meanders so that they could go to one school or the other. And that was must be in your, something I hadn't thought about. Yeah. Must be in the left gene code about serving on school boards and I being think. in civic because your father was on the board. Yeah, uh, do you remember in what decade he was? Was he was, was on the board just before, uh, just around the time City High was built, and okay. uh, they cut a lot of flack because it was way out in the country at the time. Right. It's silly to build a school that far out and those kinds of things. Uh, I, that's a genetic mutation of some kind. I it doesn't. Uh, I would. I mean, Al has been on it for. It be nine years. I had three years and I was off. I, mm -hmm. you know, I learned slowly, but when I learned, I'm out of there. And I, that was enough for that me. That was enough. Yeah. yeah. Tell me what it was like for you uh, helping at the very beginning of Head Start. And oh, it was fun. It was. Uh, getting in on the ground it floor. Was a, uh, it wasn't the initial Head Start board, but they'd had one for a year, year or two. I can't recall the, very, it was very early on the stage. And, uh, it was a new concept I hadn't heard of before, but it, but it was very, I, I didn't think that there were people who needed Head Start in the community. I didn't, mm -hmm. We didn't know that in the race here, but it, it was great. It worked out very well. I bought an old house down along on Benson Street. Uh, uh, was there for years and years, uh, and it worked very successfully. Is this in like in the mid '70s? Would you say? Uh, Is that when it started? Earlier than that, I think. I'm trying to think of that was before I was on the school board or after. I think it was before that, mm. before that time. Um, and uh, they, um, it grew by leaps and bounds. It grew so fast that they, uh, it, was just, it was just limited by the size of the mm -hmm. facility that they had. But it was fun to watch the, the kids very, you know, these kids, some of them didn't have uh, books at home, crayons, any writing materials. And uh, they just blossomed once, once they got mm -hmm. into that. Uh, Atmosphere, and then we followed them through the early grades, and uh, um, it gave them a it gave them a head start in the maybe mm -hmm. the first or second grade. And it, it's a great program. Mm. When I looked at all the things that you've been involved in, I thought, my goodness, when did you have time to practice law? But uh, you attended a lot of meetings over the years. Yes, but it's it's a nice uh, it's a nice break, and mm -hmm. it gives a, it gives you the variety that you need. Fun. When you're not teaching and you're not practicing law and you're not giving back to the community, what do you like to do to relax or kick back? And well, I play racquetball or tennis uh, with some frequency, but I'm really a world-class fisherman. And a world. Oh, let's my, hear about this fisherman. 
a world well, one of class my, fishing. One of my favorite pastimes is the annual stag fishing trip that, we, that six of us go on to Canada. Um, do you dare mention their names, or is it a secret I know, society? I know it's not. It's changed a little over the years, mm -hmm. but basically, um, it's John Colleton, Dick Hansen, Daryl Wyrick, Jerry Hilgenberg, um, Fred Smith, who used to be mm -hmm. a pediatrician here, who comes back from Winston Salem, where he lives, to go every year. And we uh, we started years ago. Um, uh, first driving up, and then when uh, Hanson Lynn Meyer bought an airplane, Dick Hanson, uh, to show you how bad we wanted to go fishing, we flew with Dick Hanson <laughs> as the pilot. <laughs> Scared the bejeebies out of Dick and everybody else. Uh, <laughs> we flew to um, southern Canada mm -hmm. and fished, and in the early days, we flew back in. They would leave us by float plane, and we would fix our own food. And stay there, they would come and pick us up. Uh, we had uh, a, a fellow by the name of Leroy Butheris, who was a mm -hmm. funeral director. So we had a variety of skills on this trip. Uh, the funeral director, probably the most important, <laughs> because he was a good cook. And he was a good he cook. He was a good cook. Yeah, Very he could, well, important. A, down he a could cook. Fishing put that trip. Way, yeah. Uh, so the early day, early years, we did that until we finally decided that we maybe we could afford the next notch up. And now we go to places where. We fly in way back in the Northwest Territories, but they have nicely appointed cabins and carpet and running water and wood burning stoves. Mm -hmm. And they bring you orange juice in the morning at the cabin. And they have guides and they, they mm -hmm. cook all of the food and have homemade bread and pies and cakes. And, and we hey, take up, we used to take up a fairly good supply of liquor, and now we take up more medicines than we do. <laughs> <laughs> and we do liquor so that we, our capacity to drink has gone down and our, our indigestion has, problems have gone up. <laughs> but we have gone there, this same group, with a few changes for over, we are, well, we don't agree on anything, but we, we the consensus is about 25 years. 25 years. Yeah, so we've gone. We're going to take a picture now, Phil, of the fish in your office. Yes. Now, there's got to be a story I, to this. Well, I caught that fish before I started fishing with these guys. Oh, before the yeah, annual fishing the, trip. Most of those I have trained on how to fish. John Colleton especially. Oh, good. Yeah, John can find his way around a hospital, but he didn't know how to fish when we <laughs> first started out. Um, we, uh, the fish I got, in, the fish that's on my wall, I was in, got that in 1960 on an earlier fishing trip. To, to, to Canada? Canada? Yeah. Uh, my brother and some other people were along at the time. We had, we had, uh, I caught that fish. That's a magnificent job. Uh, the last hour that we've been fishing for a whole week, mm -hmm. I caught that fish, big old northern pike. No leader on just this. Uh, I've been running the motor, and somebody, I think, Al, suggested I ought to fish for the last half hour, and I just tied the lure on, tossed it out, and got this big monster of a fish that we brought home in the trunk of the car because I was going to have it mounted at the uh, taxidermy school mm -hmm. at the uh, university and to find out they didn't do that. They didn't take so fish. They didn't, they didn't. They take the fish, but they wouldn't give it back. Let's put it that way. Oh. So I took it down to what was Gay's locker at the time. Had it frozen a block of ice, and and they gave me the name of a taxidermist uh, who graduated from here in uh, Omaha and shipped it by air freight. Had it uh, had it mounted, and uh, by a taxidermist who had never seen a northern pike before, because it came back with a color that was that's unique to northern pikes, uh, <laughs> and. Spent so much money getting that done, I didn't have any money for a plaque, so I, it's on a uh, hollow cord door that uh, the, a local carpenter stained for me, and it's still on that door to this day. I thought I'd just This is there. one precious fish. That's, uh, it's uh, in the office only because Joyce would not let me put it anywhere in the house at all. <laughs> uh, but it's been on that same wall, and it's stayed there ever since, and it's not going to leave. It's not going to leave. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of Joyce, the two of you like to travel. Uh, yes. And you've been on the road and going overseas. Uh, mm -hmm. Any favorite place that you'd like to go back to? Or yes, I'd, uh, yes, uh, a lot of places. Uh, but the best one was uh, photo safari to Tanzania in Africa. We went there on our 40th mm -hmm. I have to get that exactly right. Very good. 40th uh, wedding anniversary, uh, because I had suggested we ought to go someplace different 
mm -hmm. and special. And I happened to see at the office a uh, travel magazine that had something about the world's best photo safaris. Took it home to Joyce just this just because I was she didn't like the camp, she didn't like the out, outdoorsy stuff is not her mm -hmm. number one thrill in life. Um, showed it to her and she said we should do that. And by that and then by that time of course I was beyond the ability to back out, especially when I found out what is involved and the mm -hmm. costs, and how many shots you have to get and this kind of thing. But we went on this thing and it was great. We uh, lived in tents in the game parks for about nine days mm. and uh, amidst the wild animals. It was, uh, that is it was a thrill. great thing. Yeah, yeah. We ate some unusual foods and drank a Tanzania beer, which mm -hmm. was fantastic. Only beer made in the whole country. It was great. Huh. Um, and it was a place I'd go back in a, in a heartbeat. That's again. wonderful. Was this with the, were you with the tour? No. Nope. Well, it was a the safari. They, there were about uh, t eight or nine couples mm -hmm. uh, from all over the United States. And, uh, mm. met, just met some nice people, had some nice guides. And, and saw yeah. some incredible oh, scenery. Yeah. yeah, oh yes, we had a lot of pictures. Yeah. Is, I'm curious, how old was your father when he retired? About? He retired the day he died. He was 80 83. He didn't retire. He didn't no, retire. No, he Is that didn't. even in your back of your unconscious, the it's word retirement? Certainly in the back of Joyce's. It's Joyce's, yeah. okay. And uh, uh, yes, it's in there. Uh -huh. Sometimes. I know but you still you there. still do love the practice of oh, law. Oh, yeah. I, it's, uh, it's about the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's, <laughs> a, it's just a nice way. I've got real nice partners and real great people to practice with. And, I enjoy going to work every day and, and seeing clients that I would hate to miss, and, and hate great. to do without. Well, on that positive note, what more can we say about uh, you loving what you do? And thank you, Phil, for being my guest. You're welcome. I've enjoyed it. My guest on One of a Kind has been Iowa City Attorney Phil Leff. Integrity, service, and humor are his hallmarks. Three themes run through his story a deep commitment to his family, to his profession, and to the community. Phil Leff is one of a kind. Mm -hmm.